So for the first time in this presidential debate year and really in this election season, one of the biggest economic issues facing the nation took center stage, America's massive debt and deficit. During his regime, during President Obama's regime, we've doubled our national debt. We're up to $20 trillion. I pay for everything I'm proposing. I do not add a penny to the national debt. I take that very seriously because I do think it's one of the issues we've got to come to grips with. So just how crucial is addressing the debt and our deficit to keep the economy and markets moving forward? Lee Cranefuss, the founder and co-chairman of 55 Capital Partners, joins us now. Lee, it was the first time that the issue got raised. Are you, are you troubled by that? I'm a little surprised at, and troubled at how little uh, true economic uh, policy and issues are being raised in the campaign, but that's a campaign. But we're, but we're looking at, at people's portfolios as it pertains to the debt. Look, it was ever thus. When Donald Trump mentioned that, he said since President Clinton. Well, since then, we've had President Bush and we've had President Obama. And in the aggregate, we have seen the spiraling out of control debt. What does that mean for people's portfolios? Why should they be concerned? Well, I'm not sure it makes an easy link between them because one could argue, if you're a corporation, right now, debt is at extremely low rates. Uh, if you're a government, even more so, about a third of sovereign corporate debt is now at negative interest rates and 51 percent of the Bank of America uh, bond, uh, government bond index is at negative rates on a real re rate of return basis. So if you're a business you'd look at that and say maybe you should borrow a whole lot more. Now uh, the macro economy is not a big business but how, what does it mean for individuals? It does mean that they're not going to get yield out of bonds. I think it's the most important thing to think about. So the old idea of having your stocks and then some bonds that get you some income and are stable, the second part of the equation doesn't work anymore. So what does the individual investor do then in a situation like that? Well, there's a lot of things they can do, and there are a lot of tried and true practices for doing it, but it means that simple rules of thumb that we all grew up learning, hey, if the stock market's a little too risky for you, do a 60-40, put the rest in bonds. It will be stable value, you'll get stable income. Not true. If you take 40% and put it into bonds, you're going to have to go to a 20, 30 year bond before you get something that approximates the dividend yield. And this is a big part of what we do at 55 Capital Partners, explain to people that bonds are not riskless. A 30 year bond has a real volatility relative to rates. Okay, but we know that certain dividend paying stocks have some risk. There could be headline risk with a company. There could be some unforeseen issue, like for example, Wells Fargo. But how do you then go about not only picking stocks that have good dividend you know, plays, but also a great growth opportunity, and at the same time, make sure that you're not buying at too high a price. Yes, it's a tough one, and you don't. What we tend to do is think about what institutions have done for a long time, which can now be done with ETFs. With the thousands of ETFs out there, investors can, or their advisors, build a portfolio that's a multi-asset global portfolio. When I say multi-asset, it includes stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities, other things. So by putting them together, you can come up with a more robust portfolio that has more return drivers to seek and more ways of diversifying across those. Are you, are you worried that we are over tipping capital allocation into ETFs and passive investing? Or do you think that that's just it's the first inning of that? Where are we? I think that you're asking a question about some people saying, do index funds in some way undermine capital allocation markets? I don't believe so. One of the great papers in economics written by uh, Stiglitz and, uh, Bern and uh, uh, Sanford Bernstein looked at the question of when is there enough active management? And they looked at it and said, look, if no one indexed, there'd be too many active managers. And if everyone active managed, somebody could free ride with indexing. What's the balance? It's when the after fee returns or the before fee returns equal the cost of active management. But of late, it's not there. What is, I'm sorry, what is that? 1%, 1.2%? Because people don't want to pay someone level? to lose yeah. their money. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on the structure. For mutual funds, on average, it's somewhere between 75 and 150 basis points, 0. 0.75 to 1.5. But when we talk about money management, hedge funds are still trying to charge 2 and 20. They get a 10% year, 4%. That's going to be obsolete. Well, it is. 25 billion flowed out of hedge funds recently. And there's two things going on. People have radical transparency. Now, we can buy a plane ticket and know what every airline is charging. We can do everything online. Yep. The stories about how performance is 
can't be told anymore. But, but go online. So I, I got to take the hedge fund side probably because I'm in the hedge fund industry. I think the reports of our death have been greatly exaggerated because I do think what happens is as interest rates normalize, price discovery re-enters the markets and there's a role for active management. And also we both know that there's also dislocations due to emotion and other things that hedge fund managers take advantage of. So, so I'm going to push back a little, but I do agree with you that ETFs for the individual investor and indexes uh, are very, very good. But my, my central question, which I'm really trying to get at, could there be a potential disconnect between the underlying basket and the actual ETF itself? Because something happened like that in August of 2015. Is that something that you're worried about? I don't worry about the capital allocation question because funds are not the only way capital get al gets allocated. There's private equity, there's private companies. So there are ways of dealing uh, with capital allocation. Um, what I do think about is more the market forces. Does it become worthwhile to keep trying to chase alpha? And I too have been in, and am in the hedge fund business. I don't believe no one can survive. The problem has become this tight compression among the people who do very well and the people who do not as well and the returns aren't as grand away from the average. So, you know, it's a matter of picking them and finding them. Okay. You can get more benefit by building a portfolio across asset classes than you can by picking within a slice. Well, it's a huge it's, value for the individual to listen to that. Absolutely, but whether it is the retail investor who wants to just pick and choose their own ETFs on the cheap or the hedge fund uh, investment community, Let's bring a full circle back to the massive deficit and the debt. Uh, you know, Dick Cheney famously once said deficits don't matter. And you certainly had during President Obama's administration a piling on of the deficit. And then he started to try and squeeze it down a little bit, had a modicum of success there. Uh, to the individual investor question, might this eventually blow up in our faces? Or do you just look out, oh, that's too far from now, 30 years, I don't care. Uh, it might, and it depends what happens. Uh, we were talking earlier about the numbers, and I was trying to do it per household. The amount of debt we're talking about for the government works out to be uh, roughly $200,000 per household. Now, that seems like a lot, but that's comparable to what people invest in their own education. It's a comparable to what people invest in their own home. And if that gets us all the national defense, highways, waterworks, things like that, I don't know if that's off and you know, good or you know, too high or too low, but it sounds reasonable. The problem is when it's not used well, of course, right? Because then you have to keep using it, and it comes from taxes uh, in the end in order to fund all this. So uh, it's you know, future taxes from borrowing today. So that's really the question. For investors, yep. the question is, do you need to think about that way? And our view is, well, you really need to think about it as there's a broad set of asset classes, equities, real estate, uh, fixed income, currencies and commodities, and you have these across the globe. Can you build a portfolio that's robust, reliable and isn't too dependent on any one estimate. I think that's the key really, point. Really good insight, Lee. We really thank you for joining thank us.